Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, radio and television personality, rock historian, Eddie Trunk. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. Today, coming to you from multiple cities, as always, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. Jim, what's happening in Nashville? It is raining and tornado-y. Ooh, yeah, the weather here in it Los Angeles. It is that season. Yeah, we had a little of that uh, marine layer, but it's burning off. I still got my run in for the day. Hey, I'm feeling good about myself. If I could just check that box in early in the day, it just sets the tone for the whole day. Yeah, I got to do the same thing. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, you're funny. It's, hey, just, see, it's just getting up. Jim, you're going to really have a lot in common with today's guest because everybody knows this guy. He's been such a figure uh, a media personality for so long. He's a music historian, a radio personality, a talk show host, an author, and since 1983, a champion of all things rock and metal, our new friend, Eddie Trunk. What's up, Eddie? Hey, Rich. Hey, Jim. Thanks for having me. Hey. Good to meet you guys. Look at that. A little uh, little applause in the box for you. That's, you that's more production value than we had in 100 episodes of that metal show right there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, we'll definitely get into that, but I just want to publicly thank our friend Rob Dennis. Some know him as Cabo Robbo, uh, Rack and Roll Audio, Nashville, Tennessee, for uh, connecting us and making this happen. So we appreciate you, Cabo. How did you kids for meet, sure, yeah. Eddie? How did you guys meet each other, you and Rob? I, I don't recall. I think I, I think we were doing, um, I think he was doing some audio. I was doing a TV series or a shoot for Access TV at one point. And I think he was on the shoot mixing some audio or something. And I think it would have been that. Yeah. It, Rob's got a killer business now where he's going to like iconic rooms like the Ryman Auditorium or big TV shows and doing the remote, uh, the remote recording thing. And it's been great for him. He's killer at it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so let's just get the housekeeping out of the way. You're on so many shows on, you know, different types of radio, terrestrial, satellite. Where can everybody find you these days? What are the shows? Well, my, my priority, I hate to say priority, but my main gig, Rich, for the last probably four and a half years now has been a rock talk show that I do every day. It's on a channel called Volume. It's on Sirius XM. It's channel 106. Nice. And I'm on live every day, 2 to 4 Eastern, and it replays every night, 10 to midnight Eastern. And then it's it all goes on the app. And um, it's I, I kind of model it after sports talk for rock fans is what I call it because it's that sort of thing. It's this open debate discussion about all things rock, and there's a ton of guests, especially during this pandemic, I've never had more guests. I mean, I'm averaging like two bands in a, in a two hour show. So it's been really, really uh, busy and, and fun. And it's been a godsend to do. I started doing it and the channel launched shortly after that metal show wrapped up. So it was a perfect transition thing for me. And I always love talk radio and I, I, I've been doing rock radio my whole life, but I love telling the stories and doing the interviews. So to be able to have a platform that just does that is, is great. And I do a sixth show for Sirius XM, which is which does have music in it, whereas opposed to the Daily Show on volume is all talk for the most part. And that's on Hair Nation on Mondays, which is channel 39. That's 5 to 8 Eastern. And I have a podcast once a week that's basically just a repurpose of an interview or two that happened on the volume show because huh. it didn't really make a lot of sense for me to uh, interview an artist and then do it all over again just for another platform. Gotcha. So after after a couple of weeks of being on Sirius XM exclusively, then I can kind of cherry pick an interview. I can put it out as a podcast, which is great for people that don't have Sirius XM to hear what I'm doing, and also people outside the U.S. and Canada who can't get it. So that's been a, a good you know synergy there with that. And there's a you know when everything that started for me is a is an FM terrestrial radio show, which is about thirty cities. And it's a three-hour weekly show, and it's that's predominantly all music, and that's been going since I started in radio in '83. Nice. Oh wow! 
And I love the podcast. I, we, you, I, it's funny you talk about uh, sports talk for musicians as kind of like a model we had on Steve Gorman, and I used the, your podcast interview as kind of like a kind of like just catch up on all things Steve Gorman and about the book. It was an amazing resource. So thank you. Well, yes, thanks. Steve, Steve was one of the very rare interviews I've done in the last few years that I did exclusively for the podcast. Uh And the reason that happened was because I, I didn't realize it, but he had been on already a couple of the shows that were, are on my channel volume. So my program director just felt that it was, you know, he had been on telling the story a couple of times. So I said, well, let's do it. I hadn't done anything that was like podcast exclusive in a really long time. So that's what I did with Steve. And I really enjoyed talking to him. It was, uh, it was very, I loved his book. I thought his book was great. Yeah, I read it. I, I really, uh, I loved it. It was, it was a really thick book and the editor had him kind of get it down. I love, I love the other part then. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, but I hope this is truthful. The wiki says you're hailing from New Jersey. Is that where you fell in love with all things rock? Yeah, I've, I've lived in New, I, I am in New Jersey. I've lived in New Jersey my whole life. Uh, still are still based in New Jersey. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's where the, the bug hit me. I mean, for me, it was hearing an early 70s power pop band called the Raspberries. And that was the first time I heard proper rock music. And I was very, very young. And then from there, a couple of years later, walking home from high school, uh, walking home from junior high and stopping by a record store with a friend of mine. He said, hey, you should check out this band called Kiss. And like so many others, I was just completely consumed. And from there, it just went. Nice. And so some favorite bands of yours, Kiss, Aerosmith, UFO. That's not on a lot of people's, you know what I mean? That's kind of like an outlier. Black Sabbath, Billy Squire. Um, Tell us about the love affair with UFO. That's so unique. I mean, I love their music too, but it's... UFO to this day is one of my all-time favorite bands. And you're right. Obviously not a household name, unfortunately, in America, but a very, very respected band, very influential band. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, they just lost some some key members. And you saw everybody from Nikki Six to Slash to Joe Elliott from Def Leppard all talk about how much UFO meant to them. So UFO is a band that if you if you get it and you know about them and you're into it, you're, you're super into it. And they made a massive impact on so many artists that went on to way, way bigger things. Yeah. Uh, but for me, I, I just... Um, you know, I've always loved hard rock, but I always love melody. Like, I'm not into the real extreme stuff, so I've got to hear singing and melody. And UFO was a band that just masterfully combined those things, and they still do. They're still incredibly melodic with great vocals, amazing playing, and great songs, sure. but they still have an edge to them. They still bring it as a hard rock band. So they've always been a band that has been super, super important to me, and that I saw probably the first time in like around 1981. And I've been a fan ever since. They're one of those few bands that no matter how many years pass, I go to their records and they still sound as great to me as when I first heard them. I, I love when records hold up. And, and I agree. I agree with you on, on the need for melody and, you know, perhaps even storytelling. Cause you know, I love so many different types of music. Um, but I just, I cannot get into the, you know, the cookie monster cookie thing. Monster. I just can't do it. I've tried. Okay. So are you saying that's kind of like the extreme that you're not a huge? Yeah. Fan? Yeah. I mean, look, there's a lot of people that, that are into that more extreme metal and it, and some of it does quite well. And again, to each his own, I need to hear singing. And yeah. there's a, no. there's a lot, there's a lot of really heavy music that I would like if the singer sang instead of screamed the whole time. Um, to me, it's just hard to listen to. It's just, I've always been a fan of singers. And when I say that, it doesn't mean like the singer has to be this pitch perfect, incredible uh, Freddie Mercury singer, but yeah. just a singer, somebody that captures a vibe. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I get just, what you're the, saying. The super extreme stuff was, is just always been hard for me to, to get my head yeah. around. Yeah, because technically there's some amazing stuff musically going on behind the Cookie Monster, but sure. there's but just like I want to be told a story, and and you know like I, I'm for me you know as a musician as a drummer you know I decided that I was going to do this when the Police put out 1983 uh, sorry Synchronicity in 1983 and Alex. Alex Van Halen, uh, Van Halen put out uh, 1984 in 1984. Those were the bands that got me, set me on my end, you know, super melodic, super great playing. 
Yeah, well, I grew up working in a record store, and I spent years working in a record store. And working in a record store, is a, it was a, a dream job for me at the time as a kid, but also as later in my career and even now is still something I call back on because it forced me to be aware of music and, and hear music and have acknowledgement of music, even if it wasn't my personal taste, even if it was a record I didn't personally love, yeah. I had to know about it. I had to sell it. I had to play it for people. I had to tell them, Hey, I'm into this. What do I, what should I buy? So that, that really, you know, working in a record store, I mean, people are really surprised when it comes to like the eighties pop and things like that. Like I actually know a lot of that stuff. It's not stuff I listen to personally, but it's stuff I know because I, I, my God, I can't tell you how many Duran Duran records I sold in my lifetime, you know? So, <laughs> so there's, it was a very, it was a very, it's a very, it was a very important thing that served me really well later on when I had to, there's times, there's been times in my career, not now really, but sometimes in, in, in TV and radio where I, I had to do what the job called for, and it wasn't necessarily hard rock, but it gave me a point of reference to work off of, especially the years that I was on VH1 Classic prior to that metal show. I was a host there for five years before right. doing that metal show. And I did every genre of music and interviewed every kind of artist. So having had that experience working in a record store became a really valuable reference point in times like that. Absolutely, and at this guy point in human history, I think working in a record store, that sounds really sexy. Just like just the human interaction and recommending things. And hey, come over and check this out. You blow the dust off something. Now, now your brand is obviously all things rock and it's your favorite genre. But are there some other little things that we'd be surprised to hear that you, you know, you enjoy? Not really. And I would have no problem telling you if that was the case. I, I, I always marvel at people who tell me that they love and listen to all kinds of music. And I think that's wonderful. I truly do. I, I, it's hard for me to understand because I've always just been wired in such a way that I need to hear some loud guitars. I need to hear rock. I mean, uh, it doesn't mean I can't have an appreciation for other music. I, if I see a, a great country artist or if I see a uh, yeah, I mean, who can deny a great pop song? A pop song is pop because you know it's ear candy. Popular. So, yeah, I, I mean, I can I can acknowledge that and understand it and appreciate it, but it's never there's been there's really never been any genre of music that wasn't wouldn't be considered rock that I personally uh, listen to and crank up. I mean, there's some stuff that's maybe walked the line like. There's some of the more rock moments of Prince that, that I, I'd listen to from time to time. Or there's an artist named uh, Jean Beauvoir who put out a record in the mid 80s called Drums Along the Mohawk. That was like a mix of of rock and, and, and I guess, R&B that I kind of liked. I love a lot of Lenny Kravitz stuff. I think yeah. Lenny's great, especially his more rock leaning things. So, um, you know, and then there's things people wouldn't expect I'm really into, like, I love Soul Asylum, certainly a rock band, but but not a metal band. But I think right. an incredibly underrated uh, band. I think Dave Perner is one of the greatest songwriters we have, and he doesn't get the credit for it. And they still make great records. The record they put out last year was my album of the year. So, um, you know, that's what was that called, Eddie? Songwriter based. It's called Hurry Up and Wait. Yeah, because that uh, Runaway Train is it's it's such a perfectly written song and i i mean i would go see soul asylum just to wait for the encore to hear that song he's an amazing songwriter if people delve into that catalog it's truly amazing even the recent records he really is and he's the sole songwriter of all their material and uh speaking of prince michael bland prince's drummer has been the drummer in soul asylum for like that's right. 15 20 years now and they're just great that's one of the many bands i miss seeing live because they're great live too if you had to put uh, your kind of playlist together to go to your prom again, what would the first... I didn't go the first time. Really. Oh, okay. So oh, you, I didn't go. Second chance prom. Second chance. What would the first three songs on that playlist be? Good question. As a rock historian, I mean, you got to pull from this catalog. You mean just in terms of songs that I personally love or that yeah. would be fitting of the moment? Mm. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Which way do you go? I would say personally love because if you love it, your passion's going to show, and then she and then she'd be like, "Oh, okay, I like your passion for this music." 
<laughs> that would that would insinuate that I was getting somewhere, which at that time probably wouldn't have been the case. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I would say, well, one of my all-time favorite songs is a song by UFO called Love to Love, okay. which is you know Desert Island disc song record. Just that incredible song that goes like amazing melody, heaviness, jam part, beautiful melody part. Yeah. So Love to Love by UFO would certainly be on there. Um Oh boy, uh, I'd have to probably go with an Aerosmith song from maybe like something from Rocks. Uh, nice. Um, Putting this in the show notes for sure, huh, Jim? Yeah, may, uh, maybe something like. Um, well, it's not very fitting for a prom, but something like "Sick as a Dog," <laughs> you know, which is a great <laughs> song. Uh, what would it be for you, Rich? Yeah, and then like um, uh, you'd you'd have to have a Van Halen song in there, right? You got to yeah. do something from Van Halen. So, like right one now, one of my favorites would be like "In a Simple Rhyme" from Women and Children. There you go. That's none of the one. Crystal Pepsi stuff. None of the uh, none of that era. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I like the one they did with uh, Twister. Oh, you the movie being. Twister? Yeah, humans yeah, being. That was a good song. Yeah. See, look at you guys just showing beat. your rock historian chops, man. That's a, yeah. it's it's hard to take the entire recorded history of this music, which you would consider starting in the fifties with, you know, the you know, Bill Haley and the Comets and, you know, Chuck and all that stuff. And God, we have done so much stylistically with with the genre. I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, for me personally, I'm kind of a sucker for the for the singer songwriter, and I love a perfectly constructed song. So that Soul Asylum song is way up there. I think um I hope you don't laugh at me, but like John Waits missing you. I mean, is was a very perfectly written song. Great and then song. I'm, I'm also a real big fan of like Heartland Rock. So like two Desert Island records for me are Mellencamp's Scarecrow and the Lonesome Jubilee, which was kind of foreshadowing what would come to Nashville in the late '90s and early 2000s. So. There you have it, Jim. But I also love that that Ronnie James deal. I noticed that you have some. Did you have something coming up, or that just happened with Vinny Carmine and Johnny T? We we, we did a. I did a, a Black Sabbath week two weeks ago. The Sabbath, uh, Heaven and Hell, and Mob Rules records. The two they made. The first two they made with Dio are 40 and 41 years old. Wow. And we did, they, uh, Rhino just did special reissues of both of them. So I, I have a long history working with those guys on that particular era of the band. When they first came back together with Ronnie in 06, I did a lot with them. And I always was, I was telling them all the time, I'm like, you've got to, you've got to do that band again. Cause it was my introduction to Sabbath. So that when that version comes around and they're promoting things related to that version, I've done a lot with those guys. And we just did something where uh, I had Tony, Geezer, Vinny, and Bill Ward, actually. Nice. Um, yeah. you know, sadly, of course, you know, we lost Ronnie 10 years ago. So it would have been wonderful if he was, um, you know, if he was still around to talk about it. But we celebrated it and remembered it and uh, promoted these reissues. It was great to have them all on. We did a whole week of Sabbath talk about that stuff. That's Has amazing. it been 10 years already? In 10 years since Ronnie passed, yeah. And oh I, I've been, been really lucky to have hosted a lot of events for his uh, for the charity, the, the cancer fund that his wife started in his name. That's just done wow. some remarkable work. And there's two events a year in L.A., and I've hosted them since they've happened. And uh, it's, it's, just, it's not only a great, a great thing to raise funds for a great cause – but it's also great because you see everybody and it gets a couple times a year. It gets everybody that knew and loved Ronnie together and sharing some stories and memories. So it's really something that's a lot of fun and done for a great cause for the right reason. That's fantastic, man. I, I always enjoyed his music because I had a little bit of an inner geek in the sense that I loved, you know, uh, Ronnie always said that, you know, the subjects of, of uh, you know, dragons and, and, and medieval times, it just worked with music. It just was great to set music to. And I was always into that kind of stuff. Yeah, Ronnie actually wrote a lot of his songs, actually, 
People are surprised to learn this, but a lot of them were inspired by his love of sports. He wrote a lot while he watched sports. Wow. And he was, uh, <laughs> whether it was baseball, football, hockey, whatever. So when you think about it, we rock, stand up and shout, very anthemic stuff yeah. was actually inspired by him watching sports too. Fantastic. I have this quick question. pick up the nuances of that in there. Yeah. Yeah, they are very anthemic. It's like hockey arena stuff. I can see that because yeah. I, I, we, oh, dude, so good. I love it. Carmine and Vinny, I got to have them on. I think I want to have them on at the same time and they could do a drum war, man. It's like, I just love their, their, they're so complimentary of each other. Well, see, it's interesting you bring that up because when I'm done talking to you, they're waiting in the wings for me to do this exact thing that I'm doing with you with them. Tell, tell them that, that Redmond oh, said, well. hey, and I want to have them on the show. <laughs> yeah, they're doing they're doing their own thing together, just like what you're doing right now. They're also doing something like this on YouTube. That's awesome because I had, you know, Carmine's book, Realistic Rock, was the first cool drum education book because up to that point, it was all dudes like holding the sticks, traditional grip in like tuxedos with the hair parted on the side. And he's like, check out my leopard skin shirt and my double bass. And then his brother had a book called, I think it was called Rock Steady. And it was all of his licks, like all the bass drum and Tom combinations. Who are some of your favorite drummers besides those two guys? Who, who comes to mind drum wise that you admire? I know you like Tishy, right? I mean, who does? Brian's one of my favorite drummers. Uh, Br Brian is just, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's, I mean, there's obviously there's so many, but I, I love when th there are drummers that, that you love, you just, you so much look forward to watching and hearing them and watching Brian play. Whenever I hear he's in whatever band I'll go because I love watching him play. And I love hearing him play. I just think he's a, he's a beast. I love him. And a uh, funny story about Brian is, you know, he's originally from New Jersey. And I've known him for a long, long time. Right. And he, he uh, the house I'm in, my house where I'm sitting right now, I moved here and bought this house like seven, eight years ago. And I was talking to Brian. I don't know how this even came up because he's from the town that I'm in. And I told him where I was. I was out front walking around with my daughter and this guy came up and he started talking to me and he goes, you know, Tishy, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you live in that house over there. I was like, yeah. He goes, oh man. He goes, back in the day, Brian and I did some really crazy shit in that house. <laughs> and I'm like, my Don't house? And I live in now? He's like, yeah, back in the day. So I called Brian and I'm like, hey, you know this address? He's like, yeah, that's whoever's house. I go, no, it's my house now. What'd you do in this house? And Brian's told me all these crazy stories about where I'm sitting right now, which didn't look like this at the time that they were here, but this was just a open basement and that he would rehearse down here and he'd hang out and they'd party or whatever. Oh my so God. So it was what really funny uh, as far as that's concerned. But I love, you know, I love Brian. Uh, Mike Portnoy is a close friend and Mike can play anything. And I, I love him doing his thing. Um, Charlie Benanti from Anthrax, I think, is yeah. super underrated. And yeah, well, I love watching Charlie underrated. play. Uh, yeah. Ray Luzier is a monster Ray. to watch play. So I love I love a lot of those guys. That there, There's so many. I mean, obviously, Tommy Lee is always great. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a drummer named Zoltan Chaney. Sure, a lot oh, yeah. of tr oh, yeah. tricks, man. Look He's up a Zoltan. You want, to watch, you want to see someone entertaining as hell. I yeah. mean, he played with Vince He's Neal, underrated. Vince Slaughter. He's un yeah. unbelievably entertaining to watch. So there's a ton of guys out there, but those are just a few off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, now looking back at so this illustrious career, what would you say is one of your most proud accomplishments? Surviving in this business for 38 years and counting is certainly something that I don't take lightly. I sure. mean, a along the course of my career, I was told no a million times from the minute I, out of high school, I wanted to try to get into radio. So <laughs> that, you know, just, just still standing <laughs> and, and doing pretty well is, is, a, is, is a feat uh, to last that long in the industry. But uh, staying true to what I believe in uh, you know, sticking to my guns, you know, I could have, I could have taken a much easier path early on in that I got into all of this because I wanted to share music that I loved with other people. And I was very naive because I did not realize, and some people still don't, that in radio, in most 
that 98% of it, the person you hear on the radio has nothing to do with what they play. And in some cases, they can't even talk more than 30 seconds. And if they do, they're reading from a card. And when I first found out about that very early on, it was completely counterproductive to me wanting to do radio because I didn't want to get into it to try to just say I'm on the radio or to be known. I wanted to get into it to be able to get like a record I loved and said, I got to put this on and share it with people. And if I realized I couldn't do that, I was like not interested. So the fact that from the get go, I fought really hard and I did the horrible hours and I did the overnights and I did all of the non marquee stuff because I was willing to trade anything for the ability to do what I wanted to do and to be left alone and develop to develop a following and a show. And and that is probably the single most important thing that I decided to do very early on because it gave me a following, it gave me a voice, and it let me be known for something more than just being a voice between two records for 30 seconds. So that, and that's been a key to have built everything on. I, through yeah. that, I built what many people believe is one of the first ever metal radio shows to exist. And that brought me a lot of attention, even though I was working on a small suburban radio station in New Jersey at the time, but nobody was doing anything like that. So blazing my own path was, was and still remains to, be super, remains to me super important. It's not an ego thing, but the best thing for me is just leave me alone and I'll get the job done. And the fact that I'm still standing 38 years is, you know, kind, kind of supports that I, I was on the right track. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. It's a definite testament to focus and the long obedience in the same direction. Um, the only thing I'll ask is, how long did it take? How long did that grind last until you were like, okay, now I get to do what I want to do? You know, because you started out from the looks of the mid '80s. You said in a small radio station in New Jersey. Um, how long did it take until you were like, okay, now I've arrived. Now I'm here. In the radio business. Yeah. Well, so I, so it's, it's a crazy story and it's try to cut it down as quickly as, as much as possible. But I actually got, so I actually made my first radio demo on a friend's pirate radio station in his basement in Staten Island. Wow. And it, it was the guy, the guy who's actually managing the record store I used to work at. So I'm right out of high school and I wanted to, I wanted to try to get the local rock station that I grew up listening to that still exists in New Jersey, WDHA. I wanted to try to get them to play this harder music that I loved, which they weren't touching in 82, 83. And I made this demo and then the owners of the radio station, we used to come in the record store and I used to say to them, hey, 
you're not playing this, you're not playing that. Why don't you give me a couple hours on the weekend to let me play it? And they would say, well, you don't know anything about radio. And I'm like, well, I got a demo and I gave them the demo. And then the store, the record store agreed to sponsor the show. So that's kind of how the show was born. And, uh, you know, to answer your question, I mean, from 83 to 94, mm-hmm. I worked at that station. But during those 11 years, I also still continued to work in the record store. I started doing some freelance writing, reviewing records for, for magazines. And for four years, I worked for a record label called Megaforce that was the first home of Metallica. Wow. So oh, yeah. I was wearing a lot of hats and I didn't know which path <laughs> Radio I was going to take. <laughs> yeah. I, so I didn't know if I was... Because in all honesty, working at a a radio station like that, especially at that time, very difficult to make a living. I mean, people, you're not making much. (laughs) You're you're making at that time. I mean, I think it was like six bucks an hour and you're on the air four hours. So you're making (laughs) 25, 30 bucks. (laughs) Really, really. I mean, even the full timers, they were doing uh, DJing weddings on the weekend and whatever. So I had to have all those other jobs and I wasn't sure where I was going to go. I didn't know if I was going to be a behind the scenes guy and stay in the label world. If I was going to, if more radio stuff was going to open, I I, I didn't know. But the big change came for me, Jim, when in 94, I sent a new radio station came on in New York city called Q104, and they came on as a hard rock station. They called themselves New York's Pure Rock. I remember that. Yeah, and my my ears lit up because nobody had ever done anything like this in in the market. And Mm. I didn't even realize, I didn't really have a full realization of the difference between a suburban New Jersey radio station signal and New York City. Because I grew up with the local backyard station. And, and New York City, from where I grew up, was only 35 miles. So yeah. it didn't seem like it was that big of a difference. But when that station came on the air, that was the only time I applied to work somewhere else because I loved DHA. I had no reason to leave. And I, took a, a, I just took like three breaks and dropped it in the mail and sent it in. That was it. And they called me. And I went in and I met with them. And I'll never forget it because they said, look, we're fully staffed except for Sunday night, seven to midnight, we have one shift open and we know it's not the best shift, but do you want it? And I was like, well, I got to think about it. And they go, well, just so you know, it pays union scale. And I'm like, hmm. union scale, what's that? And they go, well, it would pay two fifty six a shift. And I was like, yeah. at that time, I was like, wait a minute, I'm getting 30 bucks a shift, two fifty six. Yeah. And it's like, yeah I go, I'm in. <laughs> so I took it. And, and that move from going from New Jersey radio to New York City radio is effectively going from like market 40 to market one, even though it's 30 miles away. Yeah. And all of a sudden now I'm broadcasting to three states. The reach got way bigger because this is still yeah. way before streaming and the internet and all that. Oh, yeah. So oh, I, yeah. Just, I just had way more reach and suddenly was getting way more attention for what I was doing and being paid decently. So I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to chase this. And that's pretty much why I prioritized radio ever since. Yeah. It's definitely a great medium, especially in that time. It's so, it was, I, would, I could imagine it was so much fun back then. I got in around 96, 97 at a little known rock station, the, uh, the one and only home of rock and roll, I-95 in Brookfield, Danbury, Connecticut. And uh, I got in through uh, being a production intern, which there is no such thing. Uh, some of the production meetings took out, uh, took place outside uh, in the back of the radio station, uh, smoking certain things. And, uh, it was very interesting because that's how we got creative. But, um, yeah, you definitely went from the bottom of Mount Everest to the top in one fell swoop. I mean, that's, that's an amazing story. Um, getting into, yeah, you, uh, New you, York see, City. you see, you see the, th- the big difference is, and people who spend their whole life wanting to get into radio probably want to blow their brains out when they hear this story. But I, I didn't, it wasn't my goal. It wasn't like, I didn't go to school for it. I didn't feel I particularly had a broadcaster voice. It was nothing to do with that. It was just, I love this music 
how can I share it with other people? Okay, so what did I do? I worked in a record store. I sold it to them. I wrote magazines. I told them about it. I worked for a record company. I signed some of the bands. I'm on the radio. I'm pushing it out to people. So radio is just one piece of that. I didn't necessarily know if I would be good at it. I knew I was a good talker, but I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I didn't do that thing that a lot of people do where it's like, okay, I'm moving from this market. Now I'm going to Ohio. Now I'm going to Iowa. Now I'm going to try to get to LA. I'm going to try to get to New York. It was just, I never left this market. It was just like, I started in Jersey. I I went through the tunnel. I went to New York and it's been the only place I've ever been. I've never, I I mean, I'm on the air now through syndication and obviously Sirius XM is national, but back in those days, I never left home. Well, that's amazing. It's a testament to, you know, passion and persistence because you were passionate about something and you were willing to roll up your sleeves and do the dirty grunt work, which is for a lot of musicians is, you know, you play weddings and bar mitzvahs and you do free jam sessions and do auditions and basements and play on free demos. And hopefully you shake the right hand. Something happens. Hey kid, the guy with the cigar says, follow me. I think it's an amazing story that, uh, you know, uh, if you ever wanted to do corporate speaking, I mean, I don't know if you do any of that, but it's a, it's very easy to, like, to share that message of persistence. I think the power of focus. Yeah. 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 I've done some speaking. Uh, I've done some club shows where I've just told rock stories and stuff, but yeah. yeah I mean, again, again, I, I didn't, I was horrible in school. Uh, was it, I didn't apply myself. I, 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 I didn't go to college. I, I, I knew it just wasn't for me. It's not that I was dumb. I just didn't, I just, for me, it, it was, my whole passion was, was music. I was consumed with it. And if I wasn't going to play it, and unfortunately to this day, I don't know how to play a note of anything, but if I wasn't going to play it, okay, how am I going to be in it? And uh, that, that was how I chose to express it. But you, you sound know like, you, know, like. You, you kind of, there was a guy out of uh, Hartford, uh, uh, Litch the little guy, they called him. He was the walking rock and roll encyclopedia and he worked for WHCN and I think WCCC for a while. But uh, you're kind of the same thing. You have you have a deep knowledge and can recall stuff that that's random, trivial type stuff out of nowhere. The history of that. The, what, the, the last, history of it. Yeah. Yeah. The weird so, I mean, thing you make about a name all for that, yourself though, like that. Yeah. The weird thing about all that though is that's pretty much the only thing I'm like that with. Like yeah. like that. <laughs> That's, that's the God's truth. Like I, 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 and I'm not, I'm not proud of this, but like I'm the guy that to this day, my mom will call me and say, "Hey, it's your dad's birthday tomorrow," or my dad will say, "Hey, it's your mom's birthday tomorrow." I am just horrendous with dates and history and math or anything. But when it comes to remembering liner notes or who produced a record or who wrote a song, yeah, for whatever <laughs> reason, it, it resonated. With Absolutely. your kids, uh, do you say, what's your philosophy with raising kids? Because your background and my background are very similar, obviously. Uh, I wasn't very good in school. I didn't make it through college. I went for a few years. It wasn't my thing. It wasn't for me. But I just, you know, kind of preach to my kids, you need to find out who you are. You know, before, if you want to go to college, make sure it's affordable. Don't go into debt for it. But, you know, if that's what you want to do, just make sure that you realize the early twenties, in my opinion, are for finding out who you are. Is that something similar that you impart to them? Well, big time. I mean, my daughter is 17 now and she's about to be a senior next, uh, next, uh, next time after the summer. And we're at that point with her now. And I, you know, my position on, on college, I mean, I, I, my, my kids, like I never forced them into, music or any of my stuff or just that they naturally gravitate towards it great but it wasn't like there were a lot of people that thought when i had kids like you're gonna make them into little metal heads right and i'm like <laughs> no if that's what they like great if not i mean i'm not gonna force feed anything to anybody but as far as the school thing is concerned i i have no issue with college and i think it's wonderful if people go and want that education and need that education what I have an issue with when it comes to that is there are people that just think that you've got to go to college or you can't get anywhere and you've failed if you haven't gone to college. And I don't agree with that because I think that if you have a defined role and you have a defined vision of what you want to do and it's re- and college is required for it, more power to you, go for it. But I know and, and have way too many friends 
who have had kids that have gone to college for two, three, four years yep. in massive debt, and they came out of it still not knowing what they're going to do, or they're doing things that don't even apply to co their college education, and they're massively in debt from it. That yep. I can't see. Yeah. So um, I, I, my whole thing about college is, look, I'll support and I'll help as much as possible if it's a defined thing. But if you're still trying to figure it out, then there's a lot of other things you could do. You know, I have a financial planner and he's like, we actually have a great community college here in New Jersey. And he's like, super cheap. You go there for two years and figure it out. It's a great school. And all the credits transfer if they go somewhere for the next two years. So stuff like that or... or um, or some sort of vocational school or something. Great. And again, not down, not anti-college in any way, but I do think there's way too many people that go there, piss away a lot of money and just, it's a party for four years. Yeah, for and sure. that, I'm, that I'm not paying for. Yeah. It, I, you know, I, I tell everybody I'm an overeducated rock drummer. Cause my, cause my parents were so cool. They're like, Hey kid, you don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer. You love the drums. We're going to support you. We'll drive you to nightclubs before you can get in. You know, we'll get you drum lessons. But my dad said, you're going to college. Right. So I go to college and I, and I come away with things like learning how to read music. So when Tishy says, rich, come do the Bonham tribute. And uh, you know, I get the call a week before and I could scribble out a little thing and tape it to the bass drum. That kind of stuff is, you know, really, really paid off. So, you know, there's some good takeaways here and there if you're you in the right who, you knew who you were going into it rich that's the thing well i you knew, knew i wanted, wanted to be in the music do. business you know but growing up mm. in connecticut and then going to el paso it was like who yeah. are the gatekeepers who, who are the people that are going to let me into this world and how does yeah. the music industry work you know so i was I 27 before I jumped on my first tour bus, but I like being a late bloomer because that extends the lifespan of your career throughout your, you know, I'm going to be playing, I'll die with the sticks in my hands. One, two, you know, I mean, I, that's cool with me. Um, but I've, hey, been, I've been telling my kids to go into the car business if they don't know who they are. Well, people know, well, you learn sales, that's for sure. Oh my gosh, yeah. you learn so much in that <laughs> business. You hey, gotta go do door to door sales. Eddie, I don't want to keep you too long, but I, I promised our friend Rob that I would ask you one of his questions. And this question is Who is more likely for you to invite to dinner, Sharon Osborne or Paul Stanley? <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's, he picked out the two people that don't talk to me. Um, I don't know Sharon Osborne at all. I really don't. Uh, I just, you know, you, everybody's heard the stories. Uh, the, the, the thing about both of those people is I'm in, a, I'm in a large group of really good company of people that they don't talk to. So I feel yeah. good about that because I know a ton of people that, uh, that, that, that those two people have issues with that I'm, we're all in the same group. So I don't know Sharon at all. I really don't. I met her one time. I don't, you know, I, I, I've heard things of what the issue is. I mean, there's not people just, you know, in both of those instances, there's always going to be people doing what I do that either don't hear it the right way or don't like it or don't approve of it. There are people that want the narrative to be whatever they want it to be. And they have enough people around them telling them that, yes, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. And mm. when there's somebody that knows a little too much or uh, is willing to express an honest opinion about how they feel as a fan... Sometimes those certain people view that as a threat uh, and they don't like it. Uh, I, I can't help it. I'm, I'm to my core. I'm a fan first and foremost, and I've got my feelings and my opinions and I'll express them. And I also encourage others to, and I encourage a debate and a discussion if we're in disagreement. I think that's healthy and that's great. So I've always done that. I've never said I'm the law, but I have my views and my feelings. And, you know, you can never tell though at the, at the end of the day, so, some of these people are just out there and, and, and you're like, if it's not right down the pike for exactly what they want, the, the ego could just go off the rails because they connect dots that you don't even know they're connecting and they have all suddenly there's a problem. Mm. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know Sharon at all. I, back in the day I did used to talk to Paul a little bit here and there with interviews, but would never say we were ever close. Ironically, he was always my favorite member of KISS. Ah. And uh, I mean, 98% of what I've done and said for, for both of those people and their respective bands that they work with uh, has been supportive. But that gets swept under the carpet because when you're very fragile and you're very sensitive, one thing and you're off, you're, you're an enemy. 
So to answer the long, the long drawn out answer to the question would certainly be Paul Stanley, because uh, by the way, both have always been completely open on uh, and welcome to come on my show. And I have no personal problem with either of them, Yeah, but I don't, can't speak for what's in their head about me, but, mm. but I was way, you know, kiss was mega important to me. Uh, still are most of their career for most of their career. Paul was always my favorite member. And, um, and that and, and that's coming from a guy who signed Ace Freely to his solo deal. And I'm to this day, I talked to Ace yesterday. I mean, I'm super close with Ace, but Paul was always like when I was a kid, Paul was the guy for me. And I loved his songs and I loved his singing and all that. So I would love to have respectful, intelligent conversations with both of them. But if I had to answer the question, certainly Paul, just because I'm way more of a fan and sure. uh and, and would have way more to talk about. And last time I did speak to him, which was a number of years ago, I said to him, I said, hey, man, my door is always open to you. And if you got a problem, I'd love to talk it out. But, you know, that was it. That was the last I heard of him. It's kind of hard to figure, but it is what it is. My my thing that's most important to me is that I serve my audience. I I, I want my audience to have an open, honest form for dialogue I, I have a big problem with how insanely sensitive and PC things have gotten. And I believe in open, honest dialogue, whether I agree or disagree. Let's have let's have some fun. Let's get into it. Let's mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, did you, you know have the, a thought? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about all the people that you've talked to over time. Uh, in all the different hard rock artists. Having just and, two and, that don't talk to me is a pretty good ratio, right? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> ratio. Good job. That's a but good I mean, you have, scoreboard. <laughs> you, you, you've got such a breadth of people that you, you know, are, are personal friends with you and everything. You know the scene from uh, uh, Wayne's World where they go backstage to meet Alice Cooper and they have this really high you know, cerebral conversation about the history of Native Americans in the area and stuff like that. What was the weirdest conversation or the most, you know, surreal conversation you've had with somebody and who was it? Anything come to mind? <sighs> Similar to that kind of scenario and that uh, with Wayne's World? <laughs> uh, I remember I went to, to see Iron Maiden once. And I was back in the dressing room and I said hello to Bruce Dickinson and he had just been on my show a week or two earlier. And I remember, I forget what happened. I had heard at that time, this is before he started flying Iron Maiden's plane and all that. <laughs> and I, I remember say, saying to him, I was like, Hey Bruce, I, I heard you're into, you know, flying and aviation. And you find out with these guys that, sure, that they're used to everybody asking them and talking to them about their music and their records. But if you know, if you hit them on a different level with something else that they never talk about, they light up and get real into it. Yes. <laughs> so when I brought up, when I brought up the plane thing to Bruce, he just got way engaged in it. And started telling me about all these airplanes. And the next thing I know, he's going in this road case and he's pulling out plane schematics and he's pointing to this and that. He's telling me about the engine and this. And I was just like, whoa. I mean, so that, that was kind of interesting. But I got to tell you, uh, uh, and I brought this up a lot on the air. I've said this to people. There's so many times where I'll walk, I'll be at a show and I'll be, have been backstage and I'll come back out into the crowd or people will know that I was at a show and they'll ask me like what was going on. And I'm like, Got to be honest with you. I mean, this vision of what's happening backstage, it'd be a huge letdown to most rock fans. <laughs> Massive. <laughs> because most people are juicing, talking about what cholesterol meds they're on. Yeah, this uh, ginseng what shot. What colonoscopy is. Yep. It's, it's not what you think in most cases. <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. sexy. <laughs> I, I tell everybody it's, it's smelly towels, sweaty cheese, sweaty and cheese. road cases. On, yeah. the, on the flip side of that question, what was one of the more moments, and I've had plenty of these in my career. I mean, one, one I recall one, I was interviewing or uh, talking to Jeff Tate from Queensryche. And I said, so I said, you were an opera singer, right? He goes, yeah, that's how I came up. And I was formally trained as an opera singer. I said, well, what, what made you get out of that? And he goes, rock is more fun. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just be over here now in my ashtray. In the corner, just, yeah. You know, chewing on my shoe. What kind of instances, you've had to have had them, where you, where you just interview somebody and like, why did I just ask that? Oops. Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, nothing, I always nothing, ask good questions. No, Eddie, no, Eddie's no, like, no, I've no, never no. had moments like that. You, Eddie. <laughs> I mean, look, there are times where you will, uh, I'm in a fortunate situation in that I've been doing this for so long yeah. that it's extremely rare that I interview somebody who I haven't interviewed at least four or five times before. And right. in most cases, I know, I know well enough to text or call or talk to. Yeah. So that creates an immediate comfort level for them and for me and a big advantage to me just having been doing this so long. But there are times, I mean, I, you know, every once in a while I'm interviewing somebody for the first time, of course, if it's a newer band or what have you, I mean, Earlier today on my show, I interviewed a band uh, in this moment that had been around like 15 years. But, uh, you know, I never interviewed them before, but they knew me. They, they watched my show, so there's an, that immediate advantage there. But I had Brian Adams on my show a couple weeks ago. And Brian, I do not know. I interviewed him once for television, like in 04. And the interview came to me through a guy uh, from Nashville by the name of Paul Sedotti, who plays in Taylor Swift's band. Yeah, I know Paul. Yeah. So Paul uh, is a huge Kiss fan. And Paul also played in the reformed Raspberries back around 05. And that's okay. when I met him. And Paul was just texting me something about Kiss. I ironically, it was something about Paul Stanley saying, man, I wish he would let you interview him or something like that. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, what can I do? And then somehow Paul sent me this clip of Brian Adams and playing with him and Taylor Swift. And I said, wow, that's really cool. And he's like, oh yeah, it was this amazing moment. I go, I'd love to interview Brian. And Paul set it up. Paul made it happen. Nice. But Brian didn't really have anything to promote. And, and I, I think didn't really know me all that well, maybe, and still had his guard up a little bit. So when I listened so when I started that interview, and this was very recent, if you listen to it, it's, it's on my podcast now. The first two or three questions for me got like one word answers. Oh. And, and I'm like, wow, he really is not into doing this. And I'm thinking like, did Paul just twist his arm? And I mean, I just, you know, I, I, he's, I, I don't know what's, you know, this, this could be not going so great. And it wasn't, I didn't ask anything crazy. And uh, I just think that he was, he's a fairly guarded guy because then as he realizes that I really know my shit, he completely flipped. Like after the third question, he's engaged and we're, we talked for over an hour. So, you know, once I got into like who mixed his records and who, who worked songwriting with him, I, it immediately broke that wall down. So you have those moments, everybody's going to have them where, the artist may have their guard up or you might get the one word answer or whatever. You just got to find a way to punch through. Yeah. I heard that interview. It did a great, great job. Of course, I, we're having on Mickey Curry, his longtime drummer oh, uh, yeah. next week, which will be really fun because he's got such a storied career. Um, I, had a, yeah. I had a story about when, when one of the radio stations I worked in Las Vegas. <clears throat> you know, who, you know, Dave Wellington. Yeah, sure. He works yeah, at Sirius Dave. XM now. Yeah. Oh, wow. Beef. I worked with him out in Vegas and uh, one of the afternoon jocks had a band in. we had bands in all the time because it was Vegas and everybody came through. Um, and I can't remember which band it was, but they literally did that on the air and they gave, you know, he was interviewing them about their show and what they were doing. All one word answers. And he oh, wow. called them out on the air. He says, look guys, if this is how we're going to roll, we can end it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it was live. Nice. And I was like, yes. And they changed their tune right away, didn't they? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Was was like, You're band, not doing you this remember? to me. I don't remember who the band was, but I mean, it, it was, they were kind of new and they were, you know, had a couple of hits and that was about it, but they kind of got full of themselves. And uh, yeah, this guy, he didn't take Jim, any. Reach out any to your gun. friend and see if he remembers because that'll make the story so complete. But he might not want yeah. to tell you who the, the, the band was. But Jim, um, Jim was in, was in a comp. Was it K uh, Com? No, no, it was uh, KXTE Extreme Radio. So it was okay. Hardy in the afternoon. Um, 
I don't know where he went. I think he went to Boston, but he, I don't know if he followed Dave to uh, Sirius, but uh, his, I don't even know if he's still in radio anymore. Hardy. I, I just, Hardy. I just bought a, I just bought a place in Vegas that I'm going to, I'm going to uh, have a part-time place there. Nice. I love that city. So I, I comp is the one rock station. I know that's there, but I didn't realize yeah. that Dave was there at one point. Yeah. Like yeah he Vegas was there too. from 99 to 07. I want to say. I, I had a young band in that was on their first record and, they just came in with a ton of attitude and everything. And that was the only time I just cut something like that short. And I said, you know what, guys were good. Because they nobody really knew who they were. And you were doing them a favor at that point. And it's just yeah. like, yeah. then they're going to bring this rock star attitude. It just didn't make any sense to, like, I just cut it short. And that was that. Yeah. 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 Hey, Eddie, are you open to uh, playing the uh, a, a fun game we have? It's called the Random Question of the Day. Sure. Completely random. All right, here wow. we go. It's the Random Question. Random question, random question of the day. Truly random. Here we go. I'm my tension bed here. Which means the question might suck. It may, it may suck. Here we go. What would make the world more interesting if it was a different color? Give him another one, Jim. <sighs> Hold on. <laughs> I don't know what that means. He's queuing a tension bed and pulling up the worst random question of the day ever. <laughs> I don't like that one. Oh, here's a good one. What word do you always mispronounce? Nice. Uh, I've been struggling lately with amphitheater because I've been doing, I don't know if you go with the PH as an amphitheater or it's the hard P and you leave the H silent amphitheater. <laughs> Rich and has a hard H. time with I've Rich has a hard time with ways. entrepreneur. How do you say entrepreneur? Entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. I've been watching a lot of Shark Tank lately, so I'm good with that. But yeah. I have a but, I'm a voiceover guy, so my big thing is regularly. I cannot say that for the yeah. life of me. I've oh. struggled with that one too. But Jim, what's the verdict on amphitheater? Amphitheater. I, I say amphitheater. Amphitheater. Amph, amphitheater. Not amphitheater. Yeah. I say amphitheater. Amph. Amph. See, amphitheater. That's what I'm saying. You got that H in there, so I don't know if you use that or not. <laughs> amphitheater. <laughs> amphitheater. Oh, you well, know what's going to one of, you think one of the more about it messes you up. Yeah, these yeah. poor people that have to learn the English language, there is no rules. It's the Wild <laughs> West. I mean, it really is. <laughs> Yeah, that's, well, been, that's the one that immediately came to mind because that's been coming up a lot because people are wondering when shows are going to come back in amphitheaters. Yeah, we yeah. can't wait. So I'm like, amphitheater, amphitheater? Like, what is it? Yeah. You know what, what little phenomenon I've been hearing lately when people describe uh, widths and height is height. I'm going, where is height coming from? When did this become a thing? People I thought saying, you were saying oh, phenomenon was the problem because you could go with that too. Yeah, phenomenon's a tough word. Yeah. But height? I'm like, what? who yeah. says height? <laughs> but it's actually a proper word. Go figure. Eddie, do you see why I keep this guy around, man? He's bringing so much to the table. He is the for sure. Yang. Man, we appreciate the time, man. What a what a pleasure talking to you. Make sure you say hi to Vinny and Carmine for me, will you? I will. I'll be talking to them. They 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 just launched this YouTube show called Hanging and Banging. And uh <laughs> that is so rock. Brothers, <laughs> it's this brothers and the brothers and a promoter in the Chicago area named Ron Onesti, who I met years ago, and their thing is, uh, you know, going out live, live, and they asked me to do it. So, uh, I, you know, for those guys, of course, they're, 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 they should be fun too. So I'm looking forward to it. Man, well, congratulations on all the years and all the success and bringing your dreams to promoting rock all these years, man. We really appreciate you. And everyone, be sure to check out eddytrunk.com for all things Eddie Trunk. And to all the listeners out there, we got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Why? Because Eddie will tell you there's a million podcasts out there and it, it'll help you help us get found on the World Wide Web. And we want to share our message with you. So keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here. Thanks so much, Eddie. Thank you, man. Thank you, Rich. Pleasure, Jim. Thank you. Good to meet both of you. Thank you for having Absolutely. me. And, and best of luck to you. And let's hope we get to normal time soon, right? This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.